I've got a good one for you today. I should have mentioned Pete Co is traveling, so he's not doing the regular intros that he does, but he is submitting other content, a dispatch from abroad, if you will. Excited to debut Annoying American Abroad after my first two guests joining me today. Very excited to welcome Mark Leibovich to the show for the first time. I interviewed him back in my Sirius XM days, but he is the author of several books. His new book is Thank you for your servitude, Donald Trump's Washington and the Price of Submission. You may have heard about this. It's a really interesting, fascinating book about how in the early months of Trump's candidacy, the Republican Party's most important figures were united and allowed in their scorn and contempt, even more in their outrage, that Trump was a terrible menace and affront to democracy. Then Trump awkwardly won, and Mark Leibovich tells the eyewitness account of how the Republican Party collaborated with Donald Trump to transform Washington's swamp into a gold-plated hot tub and a one-time party of rugged individualists into a sycophantic personality cult, and it is good. Mark Leibovich joins me, and I also caught up with my old friend, Ari Rabenhoff. Ari served as the deputy campaign manager on Senator Bernie Sanders' 2020 presidential campaign, and he's written an entire book about that experience called The Fighting Soul on the road with Bernie Sanders. Ari and I used to work together at Sirius XM pretty much every day. I did a whole bunch of things with him there, and so it was real great to catch up with Ari on today's show as well. So Ari Ravenhoff, but his book on being on the road with Bernie Sanders, Mark Leibovich about all the suck-ups to Donald Trump, and the great Pete Coe is the annoying American abroad. Let's just hear quickly a preview of that, and then you can listen to that whole about 10-minute conversation with his French friend Benoit, after my interview with Ari Rabenhoft. Annoying American abroad. Well, hey there. Welcome to our new segment here on Stand Up, where Americans abroad ask questions of locals and most likely annoy them. Our goal is to talk to interesting people from other countries and give our mostly American stand up community of listeners a more international perspective. Today we're in the capital of Sweden, Stockholm, where, according to the great Swedish scholar Rick Steves, one in five Swedes call home. Hopefully we can gain insight into how Swedish culture is expressed through various art, music, architecture, and their own unique place in the world as purveyors of tourist Viking helmets. I love that guy, and he is a voiceover artist. He is a great performer, a very funny writer, a musician, and he knows how to edit, so gives him a leg up to submit content here to the show. But I also just want, and Pete wants, I think it's his idea, to encourage other listeners, members of our community, to send their own dispatches of any sort. You've heard rants from Maddie C. I've had conversations with so many of you here on the show. There's all kinds of things that you could submit, and if it sounds good, if it's edited a little bit maybe, or I can do that if it's good enough, then we can get it on the show and show your perspective, your experience, your thoughts, your joy, your suffering, whatever it might be that you want to share with the world and with this community, then send Send it over. Email me your pitch. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. So that's great. Thank you, Pete Coe. And coming up, Ari Ravenhoff. But first, my conversation with Mark Leavich, who you've probably seen on, uh, he's been on pretty much every show out there. But I tried to do what I think is a different, more interesting interview with him. Who knows if I succeeded? But he's a recipient of the National Magazine Award for Profile Writing, the author of four books, including the New York Times bestseller, This Town, about the political culture of 21st century Washington. In D.C. He's also now uh, at the Atlantic Magazine after a 10-year stint as chief national correspondent for the New York Times Magazine. And before that, he covered national politics in the New York Times Washington Bureau. Before that, he worked at the Washington Post, the San Jose Mercury News. And anyway, that's his introduction. I think you're going to love the book. And Mark is on Twitter, at Mark Leibovich. And nothing could mean more than for you to tell him that you heard him here on the show and that you liked it. He definitely is looking at his tweets. So tweet him at Mark Leibovich. Thank him for joining us and tell him to come back sometime. Okay, here's my conversation with author and journalist Mark Leibovich. Very kind of you to join me to talk about your new book and congratulations. Thank you for your servitude. It's great to see you and it feels like I'm looking at myself. (laughs) Good to be with you, Pete. And, you know, it's funny. You look I, I feel like I'm looking at myself, too, because actually partly I am because like the, the sort of contraption we have is I am looking at myself, but I'm also looking at you. 
Well, so uh, there's not a lot of hair going on here. There is very little hair, and I wondered it, to some extent how you can blend in when you're doing your reporting because it's a very you're out there long enough. Look at you. Your yeah. head looks like a bullet, and you can't <laughs> sit at the Trump Hotel bar and be conspicuous. Right. So my question is. Talk to me about how you did all, you know, the reporting for this new book, because it's always important to, to talk about the Leibovich style here. <laughs> Leibovich style, you know, I wish there were a, I wish there were a plan for all this. It just sort of it's just like have the fear of God in you and hope it works out. But <laughs> basically, this was a little different. I mean, the Trump Hotel, which is, you know, Donald Trump's hotel it, like in Pennsylvania Ave- Avenue, halfway between the White House and the Capitol, was really the Republican capital of Washington for for those four years. And it was like Sodom and Gomorrah. It was like you have a Republican congressman just sort of trying to like spend as much money as possible to to basically line the pockets of the boss down the street. You'd have Rudy in there, you know, running out to smoke cigars with like wine stains on his shirts and uh, uh, the secretary of the Treasury lived there. And you'd have all these tourists and groupies and administration officials. And, you know, about over 35 times, you'd have the Trump himself coming in for dinner. He like would only stand for going out to one place, uh, not the White House in all of his years in Washington. That was the Trump Hotel. So we'd get a 40 ounce steak, shrimp cocktail, French fries, uh, chocolate cake for dessert. Same thing every time. I have every no time idea how he remained same alive. Same thing. Yeah, it's, yeah. And, you know, remember at the, at the very beginning, there was this concern about a conflict of interest, the president of the United States patronizing his own business and thus bringing in all of this business. But that's exactly that that ethics investigation apparently never took place or if it did, it was dismissed. But that's exactly what was yeah. what was happening. Their business was occurring right where uh, right yeah. there in front of you. Yeah, it wasn't just the president himself, you know, you know, frequently his own business. I mean, it was the Republican Party it was foreign governments. It was anyone who wanted to curry favor with the president of the United States, who was actually, you know, the owner of this, uh, could do so. And he would keep track who, who's coming through, who's paying money. Uh, it was bizarre. This book is thank you for your servitude, Donald Trump's Washington and the price of submission. And it's not a Trump book. It's a book about all of the sycophants and, and ass kissers and, and, and those who who really sold whatever soul they, they might have had. And you talked to so many of them. And strangely, even more strangely, they talk to you. Uh, Ken yeah. McCarthy, Lindsey Graham, Marco Rubio, Chris Christie, and so many others on the record, more off the record. Why Why would anybody talk to you about this? You know, I've been getting that for a long time, Pete. I don't know. I mean, they, they well, first of all, you know, I'm really charming. I mean, I'm pretty irresistible, but I mean, but it, it. it's... It, you know, I think it helps to have a major news organization attached to my name. I mean, yeah. I worked for the New York Times for 16 years. I worked for the Washington Post before then. I worked for the Atlantic now. I mean, so, you know, there is self-interest. They think, you know, I can reach a large audience or something, or maybe I can win over a large audience that maybe, you yeah. know, I can convince these people that, that I am virtuous. But I, I think largely it's just these are politicians. They come out in public. And, and if you know where they go and they all hung out or a lot of them hung out at the Trump Hotel, it helped to just be there. And and a lot of it wasn't just, just talking to them. A lot of them was just observing and listening. And it's not like there was a shortage of information and people were not revealing themselves in, in, in plain view. I mean, it, this was a pretty shameless few years in the Republican Party. So we know and, and, and did your the people you interviewed know how, how do you feel about donald trump i feel like you don't hide that you never have mark since since you've been writing yeah. and talking about him you certainly don't pull your punches here i mean how do you feel about him and did you know the people that talked to you the rubios the kevin mccarthy's lindsey graham did they know how you thought about this man oh yeah and i know how they feel about this man too i mean because they would say so in private i yeah. mean that was kind of the dirty little joke here which is that you know, a lot of the sort of ass kissing you see in public and you hear from these guys is 180 degrees different from what they say about him in private. They don't have a lot of regard for him in many cases in private. They, I mean, McCarthy was always saying this guy's a major pain in my ass, you know, just hates dealing with him. But I mean, you got it. He's the president of the United States and he demands total fealty and loyalty. And it's like the biggest tightrope they have to walk. I mean, my opinion is, you know, I, I feel like I have enough information about him to have made a character assessment. I feel like, you know, it's not like he doesn't reveal himself. It's not like he is hiding himself. I mean, I, I think, yeah, he lies a lot, but he's also pretty in a weird kind of sounds contradictory, but in a weird way, he both lies and, and is also kind of 
Um, you know, he's seen as a truth teller by a lot of people. So it's it's weird. But um, no, I mean, I, I was surprised, though, to the degree to which people are willing to lie about their fealty to him. I want you to guess who I'm most fascinated, whose fealty I'm most fascinated with. And then I'm going to ask you all about him. Um, I'm going to guess Lindsey Graham. A lot of people like uh, Chris Christie. Uh, no, no. Rubia uh, McCarthy. No. Um, Ted Cruz. OK, Cruz. Yeah, because he really well, I mean, all the other people you mentioned, none of yeah. them did Donald Trump say their father may have killed JFK and their spouse was ugly. And the yep. question for him is he's not a dummy. Some of these other guys, McCarthy's not the sharpest tool. Lindsey Graham, <laughs> as you write so well, we can talk about him. He, he He's a yep. pilot fish, as it's called. He likes yeah. to settle. But you, you write this. I'm learning this. This is, aren't, this is what I'm reading in your book. But Ted Cruz is a hard. He's smart, Mark. I don't yeah, get that's it. what they say. Yeah. No? No. I mean, look, he went to Harvard. He went to Princeton. I mean, yeah, you'd think he's pretty smart. Um, the question why? is, I mean, why? Why are they sick of fence? Why do they suck up to Trump? I mean, you know, first of all, intelligence is not, uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't preclude sycophancy at all. I mean, they don't have a lot of self-respect. They want their job. They want to stay employed. I mean, there is a, I guess, two degrees that we don't really understand because we're not senators or not elected officials. Um, the, the, they, they live in terror of not having their parking space, not having their staff, not having, you know, that, that pin on them that says that I'm a U.S. senator, I'm a U.S. congressman. And, you know, there, there's a real thrill there. And so, like, if, if Ted Cruz wants to be reelected in Texas, he needs to suck up to the guy. And, you know, I don't think I'd do it. But, <laughs> if you know, it's the price of submission, right? If you're willing to pay that price. You know, maybe it helps you get reelected in Texas. And that's sort of the calculation that Ted Cruz made. You know, I, I don't want to be Ted Cruz. You know, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if that makes me a lesser person or not, but I don't want to be Ted Cruz. So, so I, if that means I can't be a senator from Texas, too, too bad for me. Well, you could be John Cornyn. I mean, there, that's the thing. There are other ways to be. And I guess, you know, people, <laughs> you people can be are like asking, John Cornyn. Yeah. I, I, I realize people are asking you to do a lot of psychoanalysis and that's been overdone. That's uh, fine. Yeah. But it's but it's a fair question to ask the, a guy who interviewed these people on the record for the book and who taught to you. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you've been doing this for a really long time. If anybody's going to answer that, it would it would be you. But you wrote all the way through, you know, this book comes out all the way through after the insurrection. So, yeah. I, and man, it's really hard to put this book down as all of your work is, but t talk yeah, to me about thanks. that moment, because t t that's where a lot of people, a lot of sycophants decided I'm not right. going down with this ship. What happened there? Yeah. Who stayed, who left? Yeah. I mean, most people stayed. I mean, you know, Lindsey Graham, the day of gave a speech saying, I'm out, you know, we've had quite a journey, me and yeah. Donald Trump and, yeah, and like, I'm I out. Have you know, had enough. That is I'm, just about enough. I can't anymore. Just, I'm out. That can't yes. Be I'm perfect. That's I think that's exactly. Yes, yeah. you're right. Um, McCarthy, you know, M McConnell, like in the most in the harshest possible terms, condemned him. You know, they 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 lost their nerve in so much as they even had nerve. Right. I mean, they were afraid of I mean, literally the next day. OK, after January 6th, Lindsey Graham goes to the airport. He gets harassed by a bunch of Trump supporters um, going to the going to his plane. And, um, you know, that seems to have been a line of demarcation. Uh oh, Lindsey doesn't want to get, you know, heckled at the airport anymore. So he's got to, like, stay on the right side of Trump support. You know, again, I mean, it didn't take much. I mean, Trump's big genius is that he recognizes weakness in people and he exploits it. You talked to Trump many times. I did a lot in 2016. I, he stopped. Well, <clears throat> I visited the White House once <clears throat> and had sort of a um, spontaneous drop by. I mean, I wasn't expecting it, but like the guy was just sitting in his office watching TV watching like a replay of Fox and Friends mm. and uh, they walked me in. So, yeah, I saw him in 20. 17 but i haven't talked to him since. you heard anything uh if he's heard about the book about the book no i don't think he read the book uh, so, i mean it's not about him i mean it's not right. a trump book per se right. so I I should have gone there. sorry I, I got tempted to know what he thinks and i don't want to let's get back to your book it mm -hmm. doesn't matter that yeah. so the you categorize kind of you know the idea of of, of who feels away and i think it's mm -hmm. kind of fascinating how you can categorize because the, the 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 one big question is how do you 
want history to see you. I think most of us think of yeah. that way to some extent morally, whatever your moral philosophy that inf- influences you. Who do you want to be? Who were you? And how yeah. do you categorize those who did peel away? Because you said most of them didn't stay. Yeah, I mean, you know, most of the, first of all, you you ask like a question about like the legacy question. How do you want to be remembered? Or what about the verdict of history? Or how do you want your grandchildren Hmm. to, to remember you? Or or what do you want them to learn about you? I mean, there are a lot of different ways of asking the question. And and there are some category of them, like Trump himself and Rudy and and Lindsey Graham and McCarthy. Like they look at you like you have like three heads. It's like, they don't want to answer this. Like that's like a burden. Like anything that distracts them from the day to day sort of expediencies of winning their election or, or winning favor from Donald Trump and staying on the right side of the base. I mean, that's all that matters to them. Um, but, you know, people like Mitt Romney, Liz Cheney, who who have been pretty critical or very critical of, of Trump and have broken with him to, to great political, you know, to, to, to great danger, I guess, politically to them and actually physically to yeah. them um, are, uh, you know, they do sort of take a longer view. They both have parents who served you know, at high levels, the Republican administrations and, and the Congress. And, and so, you know, it does vary. But I think, the, you know, the people who do take a longer view tend to have family legacies. Sir, when you're writing this book and and you're thinking about uh, how it's going to come together and, and what they're saying to you in real time, anything, mm. what jumped out that really surprised me? Like, I can't believe that Kevin McCarthy just said that to me. And I mean, I obviously know some of the things, yeah. you know, it's got to be on the record. I'm sure they said things that. Yeah. Can... <sighs> yeah. They said both. things. Yeah. It's always astounding. I, I, I don't believe what people cop to. I mean, I think part of it is a lot of these Republicans have been running away from reporters for so long. And when you actually finally get them corralled, it's like, you know, it, it comes to the surface maybe more quickly. But look, they, they're. um there does seem like a real kind of misery to some of these folks. I mean, like McCarthy does not look like he's having a good time trying to make this work. Graham doesn't seem, I mean, actually Graham's a little different, but you know, Marco Rubio, Cruz, McConnell, I mean, this is not fun for them, but I don't know. I don't know why they're so open about it. Maybe it's a cry for help or something, but uh, it's a weird thing they're all living through. And I don't quite know what they get for it, except, you know, reelected. And that's sort of what they want. Does it? I feel like we've not seen the kind of been following politics covering it for almost 15 years, the kind of pivots or reversals or just almost denials of certain statements. I mean, we, we've seen yeah. everybody from McCarthy to Rubio to everybody who ran against him in the primary warn about the threat yeah. that Donald Trump would be all that has come true. Yeah. And then we see it with our eyes and our ears, Mark. And then you ask them about it. And what do they say? Yeah. It, how do you take them seriously? You know, I don't want to talk about that. I'm not focused on that today. I mean, there are any there are different ways of like evading the question. But no, I mean, like there's this ethic now and Trump has sort of made it so, which is like nothing matters. Right. People forget everything burns off, which to some degree is true. Like social media, you know, six hours later, people move on to the next outrage. Right. And and one of the, you know, the most the biggest enabler or one of the biggest enablers of what Trump has done is just people have like a, a outrage limit. Like they, they have very short memories because there's like always something else to sort of roll along and replace it. So, um, you know, they feel like they can just sort of skate away. And, and in many cases, most people just don't have the bandwidth or the energy to sort of maintain their level of, of disappointment or outrage. So you have, you're an astute student of, of politics, you've covered politics, and it would seem that you see the threat to our democracy that, that a lot of folks do, and including yeah. a whole bunch of experts, historians that I'm sure you're familiar with, people like Tim Snyder, Ruth ben Giat, Kenneth C. Davis yeah. wrote a book about strong men, and you kind of are reporting in real time what authoritarians do, as I'm learning yeah. about history's authoritarians doing it. Can you give me some examples that I think inform the actual archetype that we're now seeing play out from history? Yeah. I mean, I think, again, like one of the things is just, again, just outrage meter. They just sort of lose their will after a while. Um, Another thing that people, I think, underestimate, and it's really quite straightforward, is just threat of physical harm. I mean, I remember around January 6th, there were all these really freaked out kind of backbencher Republicans who you know, they wanted to vote for Biden certification because that's what people do. Right. I mean, every four years, with some few exceptions, they vote for certification. But all of a sudden, you know, Trump says you must vote against certification. And, you know, Ted Cruz and, and Josh Hawley and and um, 
Jim Jordan, a bunch of members of Congress were saying, yeah, let's all vote against certification. All of a sudden you have you know, McCarthy himself, the leader, and, and a bunch of others, like four, 147 Republicans are voting against Joe Biden certification, which, you know, there, there's no, there's just no case for there not to be a certification. And the reason for this, over, in probably in most cases, was threat of physical intimidation. They were being overrun by death threats and threats to their family and, you know, crowds and mobs gathering outside their office. I mean, to say nothing of what happened on January 6th, which they all lived through and we're all scared shitless of. And um, you can say that on this. right? Yeah. Shitless. Yeah. Sorry. I said it. I mean, whatever. It's, how dare you? I, I mean, well, yeah. how scared were they in terms of what is your reporting show? Who did you talk to? What did they tell you about the kind of threats that they came in? And, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say I don't have sympathy for that i've been attacked no. several times yeah I mean, we've all no it's no fun it is no fun no one wants i mean like susan collins i remember the senator from maine yeah. i mean she was afraid to go home for a while i mean she stayed at uh, actually senator murkowski's house on capitol hill i mean there there's a lot of you know stories like that and it was through the roof and you know members of congress now get a lot of police protection when they fly into an airport um, a lot of them have extra security detail the capitol police is overrun uh, obviously, on January 6th, they were literally overrun and, and you know, a few of them died. I mean, it's terrible. But um, look, it is sort of what they sign up for now. And, and, you know, they can leave and a lot of them do leave because of this. But but ultimately, it's worth pointing out, Pete, that I mean, that that is the definition of of authoritarianism. It's yeah, it's politics, not by persuasion, not by debate, not by politics. It's by intimidation. Do this or else. That's not our system. I have so many uh, questions around all of this, but I want to try to stick to the book because it's so good. Mm -hmm. And I learned so much. You've been been talking to a lot of people. Uh, what is funeral porn about? I haven't gotten there <laughs> yet. I mean, the chapters yeah. uh, alone will make you want to buy Mark's, <laughs> Mark's book. <laughs> yeah. Wait, um, go ahead. Fun yeah, funeral porn is basically it's a long treatment of John McCain's funeral. I love a good funeral. Um, I, I like you can learn a lot about the humanity of Washington or the lack of humanity of Washington by sort of watching the cocktail parties that break out in, in a funeral and like you sort of the posturing and the speeches and, and McCain's funeral. Um, and, you know, I, I don't remember why I called it funeral porn. I don't know. I mean, basically, it's just like people love this stuff. It's all it's on all the networks. Um, they want the invite. I mean, it's treated like, you know, I want to be invited to this, like I want to be invited on to, you know, right of the White House. Or right, something. right. Um, so it's crazy. But um, no, but I mean, McCain's funeral, which, which Trump pointedly was not invited to, we spent the uh, morning tweeting about, you know, various grievances. It was it was sort of like a, a funeral for the old guard. You'd have Obama and Bush eulogizing McCain. Um, you know, no one mentioned Trump's name, which probably drove him crazy, but, but it was clear that he was like the unmistakable looming force here. And, uh, it was quite a scene. Ivanka and Jared showed up, Lindsay orchestrated that. And it was interesting watching people move around. Rudy showed up. It was just, you know, I, I think you, again, it's, it's always good to sort of step back and deconstruct scenes like this and sort of talk about it. They give a great sort of snapshot of, of, of both, obviously the person who died, but also the the survivors and also the moment of history we're living through. So that's sort of what I focused on with the McCain chapter. It's a, it's, it's fascinating. Mark, I, I've always thought, I've long thought that Trump stays in power. People get in power. People get ideas because right wing media is so dominant. You know, I worked at Sirius XM, Comedy Central, CNN, MSNBC, and I've mm -hmm. always been worked, sat in the same office with one of the right wing media yeah. guys at Sirius XM for years. Got to know these yeah. guys and understood the game that they're playing as a stand up comic. I worked at Colbert at The Daily Show I, and I've mm -hmm. covered serious politics my whole career. But I firmly believe mm -hmm. that Mark Levin and Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and now Tucker Carlson, and then I'm far more extreme people like Nick Fuentes and others, uh, Matt Walsh and others on YouTube and podcasts. Mm -hmm. They are what keeps Trump in power and Trump feeds off of them. And did you reach out to uh, any of the media types that are, did, how much do you agree at all with, with what I, what I'm, you know, what I think about I, their influence? Absolutely. I know. I agree with it a hundred percent. I mean, especially Fox news. I mean, chief, chief among the, I mean, I didn't reach out to them much because I mean, there have been books about written about them. I mean, I think the media, it's its own the conservative media, yeah. right wing media, whatever you want to call it, pro Trump media. That's its own story. And it's a huge story. And I think it's, 
frankly, you know, it's a huge, huge asset to Donald Trump. I mean, I, I think if Nixon had that apparatus at his disposal, he probably would have survived Watergate. Um, uh, but it's a game changer because the left don't they don't have that um, at all. The Democrats don't have that. And uh, for whatever reason, the formula really works with with far right politics and with the kind of you know, outrage that Donald Trump perpetrates and, um, you know, the, the right has a real monopoly on it. So, no, I, I didn't really go there in the book, um, but someone should. And I know it's it's certainly the, their power has been well documented, but I don't think it can ever be enough documented. Uh, it's only growing, too. That being said, you did talk to Paul Ryan and Paul Ryan is on the board of Fox. And you point out yourself the. The, the kind of, I don't know if I want to be nice, irony or hypocrisy of being upset about the insurrection and then staying on the board of Fox where the big lie has been told and continues to be told. And, and, and yeah. so, I mean, what about what did you learn from him? I mean, Ryan is someone who I spent a fair amount of time with when he was Speaker of the House. And, and I visited him a few months ago and he was telling me what it was like to sort of be sitting at home watching January 6th. And he burst into tears. Like he was like watching this and he was so appalled by it. He just like found himself sobbing and he's not a big crier. And there he was sobbing. And he wrote, a, you know, he saw his old security detail getting beaten up and he wrote them notes and everything. And finally I said, you know, Mr. Speaker, are these tears of complicity at all? Like, I mean, you are sitting on the Fox board and um, he didn't want to go there. Uh, he didn't want to speak on the record about it. And that's fine. But, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I took that to mean he doesn't have a really good answer for it. He's just sort of like hoping that, that like he can have it both ways. I mean, I don't know. I wasn't buying it, but uh, you know, I also don't think he's insincere when, when he was talking about how upset he was on January 6th. I think there's a lot of dissonance there. If I'm really trying to be compassionate, people like Paul Ryan sometimes think that they convince they can be the smart person in the room and, and, and tell, you know, people to calm down with, what kind of conspiracies or overt racism, whatever it is, but uh, it, mm -hmm. experience shows us from Boehner to Ryan to McCarthy, the, the, the winners yeah. are the, are the craziest, loudest, lunatic, dumbest people. They're the ones seemingly that are influencing actual Americans, voters, certain percentage. Yeah. Well, I think there's a chicken egg thing here too. I mean, I think one of the reasons that, that those voices are so powerful and because Donald Trump has, and, and one of the reasons Donald Trump has been, given so little pushback is just so many other of the putative leaders of the Republican party have waved the white flag. I mean, there's no counter argument. I mean, it'd be one thing, you know, if there were 20 Liz Cheney's instead of one, I mean, maybe it'd be a game changer, right? I mean, maybe there'd be a fair fight here, but you know, when, when the people who can put a check on Donald Trump's power basically are, are weak and are not willing to fight. This is what you see. You see a vacuum and you see Donald Trump consistently filling it with the enablement of these folks and with Fox and with every other sort of built in advantage. They have. Yeah, there's a vacuum and you can picture a truck just dropping a pile of shit in it. And then everybody just goes and feeds at it. All right. Last question yeah. is, you know, you, you, you talked to one Republican, one uh, Republican congressman who s admitted to you that the Rep their only plan, Republicans only plan how to deal with Trump in 2024 is we're just we're waiting for him to die because and I think it's your analysis that you think that I, I think I heard you say this and I was really shaken by it because it's you saying it you got you're a pretty smart guy that if he wants it it's his he he can he can get the nomination oh yeah. I think he can I mean because no one's going to stop him I mean that's past his prologue right Pete I mean that's like they haven't before and they're not going to again if he wants it he can take it I mean the the that Republican congressman that you just quoted saying that I mean I think that goes perfectly to the passivity of of the Republican Party it goes to them just expecting the problem will go away um, not by anything they do but like there will be an intervening event God will will come down and, and solve our problem for us I mean hasn't happened to this point and the guy seems to be um, able to survive a lot of bad nutrition, bad um, physical fitness. I, I don't know. I mean, he's been, I don't, I don't see any reason to think he's going anywhere and I don't think he wants to go anywhere. Anything you haven't told uh, anybody that's interviewed you, I really appreciate you joining me, but I got about a minute left with you from the book that uh, you haven't shared. One, yeah. One thing I haven't shared to the, all the other interviewers is that Pete Dominic is my favorite. Um, thank you. That's pretty good. Yeah. I, yeah, I thought yeah. it'd be impolite to tell the others though that, right. <laughs> um, no, I mean, um, geez, uh, what have I told them? I, I mean, I, I don't, what happened? I don't know. I mean, I think 
Not really. I mean, I think it's, I think the book's pretty exhaustive. It was exhausting to write, but I think it was important to write. And I hope people will read it. I mean, one thing that I, I do want to get out there is everyone seems to be laughing a lot. I mean, just because it's a depressing subject and it's a serious subject doesn't mean people yeah. can't sort yeah. of enjoy the ridicule and the scorn that I try to, you know, you know, bring to the record here. Uh, that's one of my favorite things about the book and you and Mark. I appreciate you joining me here today and congrats on it. I'll talk to you for the next one or the next article. It's always great talking to you, man. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure, Pete. We'll see you again. All right, Mark Leibovich, everybody. If you liked that interview and if you like me, more importantly, he's a big deal and he'll share the tweet. See, see, you might not want to like kiss somebody's ass. You might not want to reach out, but uh, be on Twitter even, but it's helping the show because Mark has a huge following amongst all kinds of other journalists and Washington people. And whether you not, whether you like Mark and, and that interview or not, he knows everybody and he'll share it. So go ahead and tweet him. And that's the purpose I always ask you to do those things. It helps me get these types of high-profile guests when they let others know that they said yes to doing the show. It gives me the, the credibility to get the guests. Mark Leibovich on Twitter. Thank you for your servitude is the book. I hope that you like that. And I hope that you like my conversation with Ari Ravenhoff. Ari and I used to work together at Sirius XM. He hosted the early morning show on the Progress Channel. And we worked together quite a bit at the conventions. And we didn't see each other that much. And we didn't get to know each other that well. But we certainly got to know each other pretty well. We were almost always on the right side of things. And I always had a great deal of respect for his opinions on all of the issues when it came to politics. Policy and politics. His writing has appeared in the New Republic, the Washington Post, and pretty much every other public publication out there. He served as a deputy campaign manager on Senator Bernie Sanders' 2020 presidential campaign. He was a uh, an aide from 2017 to 2021. Before that, he worked for Senator Harry Reid before Sirius XM. And his new book is called "The Fighting Soul." On the road with Bernie Sanders. Whether you like me, Ari, or Bernie Sanders, I think you'll like this interview because it gives an inside look of what it's like to be on a presidential campaign, although, albeit not a very typical one, because Bernie Sanders is not a very typical politician. And I think you're going to like it. I hope you like it. If you do, tweet Ari, of course, get the book, and let me know what you think. And coming up after that, uh, a great dispatch from Sweden with the great Pete Coe. So you're not going to want to miss that. Here we go with Ari Ravenhoff. Well, look who it is, ladies and gentlemen. A guy who I, I don't know. I, I think Ari Ravenhoff, I don't know anybody who's more like Steve Bannon than you. And I'll tell you why. Well, wow, that's, a, that's a way we used to. So Steve and I, when we were both at Sirius, most morning when he was out of the D.C. studio, we happened to have the same uh, bathroom urinal schedule for our shows. And there was a, there was a lot of urinal uh, meetings with Steve Bannon and I. I'm told he doesn't actually urinate. He, and he, he just uh, disappear from the studio and appear in the men's room. I, that's, that's what I witnessed at Sirius, but maybe you didn't get the honor of. Uh, well, I, I would kind of walk in and he'd be there. So that could be true. <laughs> the reason I say that is because. One day you're hosting a show on Sirius XM, and the next day you're running the prominent campaign of a presidential candidate. I like to believe that's where the parallels between you and, and Steve Bannon uh, start and end. But that's basically what I feel like happened with you. Where did Ari Ravenhoff go? Oh, he's he's running he's running Bernie Sanders' campaign. So what did I miss uh, in terms of goodbyes oh. from you and I worked together? I've already told people about that before. But all of a sudden you were gone, it felt. So what, what happened was uh, election night 2016 happened, and I was at the Javits Center uh, covering it for Sirius. I was doing, like, there was a progress, Sirius XM Progress was the channel I was on. They had all the hosts that night, and they had Mark Thompson, Michelangelo Signorelli uh, in studio in Rock, where, you know, the... the yeah, six I was right down the hall, do, in studio, live as well. And then they had me at the Javits Center kind of interviewing people, doing the thing. It was going to be a big victory celebration. campaign. Uh, yeah. Uh, they were going to break the glass ceiling with the glass ceiling of the Javits Center. Right. You know, last, the last crappy metaphor of that campaign. And in an embarrassing moment, I went on uh, Tommy Laren's show from Javits Center before. It was like taking a victory lap a little early on that one. Went on Tommy Laren's show, was interviewing people for uh, Sirius. And there's this moment where I'm interviewing someone on Sirius and I see the Clinton surrogate kind of wranglers enter the 
media area. And I see them like grabbing their surrogates and pulling them out of the hall. And I was like, that's, I was like, Oh shit. What, what's going on? Mm. So I, I leave the air. I take off the thing. I'm like, I give me 10 minutes. I like run into the back there. I run into a Hillary aide who had actually worked for me uh, years before. And I was like, what's going on? What's, and he goes, Florida, the numbers can turn around. Numbers can turn around, man. Something like that. And I was like, you guys lost. Yeah. I was like, you, 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 and this was like very early. I was like, you guys have lost. And he's like, no, no numbers, numbers will turn around. And I was like, Holy crap. Donald Trump's going to be, it was nine 30 at night. I went back on air very early and I was like, I, and I said on serious progress, Donald Trump's going to win. Yeah. Like I, I, and cause I know the feeling here. I know what a losing campaign feels like. This is a campaign that's going to be surprised on election night. And uh, I got a text from one of our bosses, serious being like, that's a bold, that's a bold call there. And I was like, look, I, I'm right. And Sadly, it turned out I was. I was at Javits till one in the morning. I was staying like right next to where the Sirius studio was. I was on air at six in the morning. So I woke up, I got to the studio at like 5.30 and the two overnight hosts who would, they hired Joe Sudbay and Linda Sarsour to host that night. Yeah. And they're in tears and I'm in tears and I'm about to go on air. And there's always, I always had this like paranoia before my show, like in the five minutes before my show about like, what the hell am I going to say for the next three hours? Sure. But like, I had a plan. I had guests. I had a, like that day legitimately was totally blank. <laughs> All, everyone who was supposed to come on the show canceled every single guest for look. And I don't blame them. I would have canceled too. Yeah. If I didn't have to go on. So I had three hours with nothing. I don't remember that show at all. I do remember getting a note from uh, Dave Gorab after being like, that was a brilliant show. One of your best. I was like, I don't remember a second of it. Um, he's like, you did a really good job with that. But I started to realize two things kind of quietly within me to do a show on progress during a Trump administration. I would have to take a level of anger every day to air that I don't know if I could sustain I didn't think I could sustain to do the show that was needed. So I felt not confident in myself. And then second, I felt like I had to, you know, I had done politics for years, went over to Sirius, felt I had to jump back into the fight. And I had spoken to Harry Reid about this. And he was like, why aren't you working for Bernie? Hmm. And, and I was and, like, well, I'm just real quick, just because it's important, you had worked for Senator Reed. Harry Reid in, in a previous life. What did you do for him before? I was kind of his lefty, like I did like the lefty politics and some communications work was the, and some online uh, organizing. So it was kind of a mix of those three elements. So, so he suggested that, that you work for Bernie Sanders. He was like, you are Bernie Sanders. I don't understand why you haven't worked for him before. Hmm. Like, why aren't you working for him? And so he and Faz Shakir, actually, who ultimately became campaign manager when I was deputy campaign manager, introduced me to Bernie. I ended up interviewing in Bernie's office and he ended up offering me a position. And I'm kind of the I don't know if I'm running for president, but if I do, let's set up for that. Uh, and he legitimately didn't know if he was running for president. I thought it was important to fight regardless of whether he was. I felt Bernie was a place to fight against Trumpism. I felt he was going to be one of the people who would be aggressive. And yeah, and, and funny you started the show that way. When I called um, when I called Dave Gorab to let him know that I was uh, leaving, he, he got like, he was pretty upset, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then he like called back 10 minutes later. He got off the phone, he called me back 10 minutes later and he was like, well, he's like, of my political hires, he's like, one is Steve Bannon, who's in Trump, and you're going to Bernie. Can't say I did a bad job. I was like, that's a that's a good way to look at it. Um, I've got thoughts yeah. and things uh, to talk about in terms of media and Sirius XM and, and your experience there. I'm not sure how interesting they would be to other people, yeah. but but I, I want to, you know, stay on the book and stay on you and, and, and what was next, because... It's so fascinating. You say, you know, how Harry Reid said, you're, you're just like him. 
you really are just like him. You're a New York Jew and you're ideologically similar. And that's not where the similarities end. Is that right, Ari? No. And my grandfather was named Bernie. So when people ask, how do we, who was a New York Jew uh, from the same, you know, yeah. from a bit older generation, you know, like one kind of generation older, but I, you know, it, it can, it, it created a connection. Like I knew his, I knew that's what I grew up with. Like my grandfather and I were very, very close and it was a Bernie and my grandfather are very similar in a lot of ways. There are, this book is, is really fascinating because it really pulls the layers back about who Bernie Sanders is as, as a person, what he believes, why he believes it, what worked, what didn't work. And certainly your experience with him really enjoying it, the fighting soul on the road with Bernie Sanders. And so first and foremost, I just kind of want to know, you know, generally speaking, what are the differences between what people know of, of this guy publicly and what he's like privately? I mean, th this is what's weird. First off, there are like very few. It's not like he's two different people. Like a lot of politicians have kind of two personas. A lot of public people have, frankly, have two personas, like they're public and they're private. He, he can't he he doesn't accept for the cursing. He does his his mouth behind the scenes is a lot dirtier than his mouth. Right. In, he, he is. There's a story I tell in the book about um I put up Andrew Cuomo, who was in a primary at that point, uh, said something like, I am lockstep with Bernie Sanders on policy, which was clearly like laughable. And I tweeted out like the idea that Andrew Cuomo and Bernie Sanders are lockstep on policy is 100 percent great American bullshit. And you tweeted that, that the, the fact that that's a ridiculous thing, that's bullshit while you are working for Senator Sanders. Yes. Go ahead. And Bernie and Cuomo like got pissed and like calls are being made to people, to my bosses about like, like Ari should be punished for this. Like how dare he and like, how dare he insult Andrew Cuomo? And like, I, I literally Bernie's on a plane flying from Vermont to DC while a bunch of this is going down. I run to the airport because I'm like, I will meet his, the guy who picks him up at the airport so he gets in the car at National and, and um, the guy looks, he looks in the back and I'm sitting there. He goes, uh, like, what are you like? Clearly something's wrong because you're here. And I was like, well, let me tell you what I did. And I tell him and he just starts laughing. He, he thinks it's funny. And then he goes, and he's like, all right, all right. But when you're tweeting for me, you know, you tweet your tweets on my tweets. And a better tweet would have been, uh, Andrew, if Andrew Cuomo and Bernie are locked up on policy, he should support Medicare for all. Uh, He's like, cause we don't, don't say bullshit. Like that's, you know, we don't, don't that, that represents me. He was, he was, he's, he's like, don't curse in the tweet. Oh, uh, it's so much better uh, in rarely is an interview better than the book, but in the, in, in, when you get to do the impression of the principal who you write about this whole, I do like that. So keep it going. So that's a fascinating point but, that he makes. That's one, but the other thing is, look, the other things are, he is, he is a really funny guy who, like it often doesn't show in public because he's kind of this serious figure, but he's legitimately like has this very dry cracking sense of humor where like I tell a story about like we're driving into the Coachella Valley from L.A. and there's this giant uh, wind farm there. If people have driven from L.A. to Palm Tom Springs, they've seen this and he was sleeping in the car yeah. and it's just him and I driving alone from LA to, to, uh, to desert hot springs, actually of all places. And we, we get over the hump and there's this, and he looks up, he like is sleeping like this. He looks up, he's like, that is a giant mother effing windmill. And he didn't do <laughs> like, it just, it's it, a, it's a it, giant it, motherfucking windmill. That's what he said. That, that is a giant motherfucking windmill. And just go to sleep. And like, that's like, <laughs> like it was clearly just like, just funny moments like that, that he's being intentionally funny or my other favorite, like my other favorite story that's in the book is we're outside the Capitol building and we're driving across the front and he's in the front seat of the car and we stop at a red light and there's like a group of school kids at the red light crossing and they see Bernie Sanders in the car. They're on like their school tour. They go crazy. They're screaming and screeching. 
and he opens up the window and he's letting them take selfies through the window and the light changes. He's like, guys, guys, gotta go, gotta go away from the car. So he rolls up the window. He starts pulling away. He turns around to me in the back. So he goes, I'm like Mick Jagger. Oh my God. That's really, really funny. His references, <laughs> his, we learned so much uh, uh, about him in this book. I mean, you say that you spent more time with, with Bernie Sanders over what? Three years period than any, yeah. including his own yeah. life. We were we were constantly on the road in D.C. We'd have dinner together. Um, I spent more time with him than my wife, which, you know, was not the best for my marriage, but was was the job. Look, and the other thing to know about Bernie is where he comes from. And I think that's he's very hesitant. And I wanted to give people a little bit of that because he's very hesitant to talk about that history. His parents, Mm. he's even hesitant in private to talk about it. He's and the role that certain aspects played in his life from like growing up with parents who died young to frankly baseball, which if people don't know the form, the, his ideology comes from baseball. If nothing more than anything else. How so? So he, the biggest thing in his life as a kid was the Brooklyn Dodgers. And by the way, to this day, he can do the lineups. Like you ask him the lineup. Sorry. You ask him to do the lineup uh, of the Dodgers he can do the lineup of the Dodgers. But when the Dodgers left Brooklyn, he saw this as like Walter Malley took something that was part of their community yeah. and moved it across the country. And the way he describes it is like, he's like, it's like if you told me that Prospect Park was now going to be in LA. He's like, it doesn't make sense. The right. Brooklyn Dodgers were part of our community and a rich person for their own profit can just tear a part of the community out of the community and move it across the country. Right. That's not, that's not right. One of my one of my favorite moments with him is we were in Arizona and we ended up going to visit um, Dodger spring, spring training, which he was so excited about. And we kind of just scheduled on a lark and we, we knew he'd just like it. And we, he was wearing a Brooklyn Dodger hat when he showed up and they came out and he's like in the locker room and they come out. The Dodgers guys come out with a stack of like Dodger hats for all of us, L.A. Dodger hats. And they handed him one and he was like, nope, I'll keep this one up. Oh my God. He would never he wear the yellow Dodger hat. Kept the Brooklyn one on. He stayed a baseball fan. He stayed a Dodger fan, but he would never go as far as wearing anything that said. I, I actually don't think he stayed a Dodger fan. I think oh, really? He, I was yeah. going to say, because you would, uh, you could see it either way and you wouldn't blame someone either way. But when you talk about, you know, that, it, that affecting, but his, he's not wearing an LA Dodger hat, but he likes, I mean, I've been with him to be what he really loves with baseball. When he was mayor, he brought a uh, minor league baseball to Burlington. Oh, wow. Because he thought it was a part of the community. It's actually so when baseball started contracting, when they started contracting the minor leagues a few years ago. Yeah. We ended up in the middle of the campaign coming to New York to meet with uh, Manfred at MLB headquarters. And they got into a huge screaming match about this. Is that the uh, commissioner? Yeah. And ML like huge screaming match between the two of them about contracting minor leagues into Bernie. The minor leagues are a place where like for five bucks, you can take your kids and they can have a yeah, hot dog yeah. and meet the, and it's kind of to him, the pure like form of community. That's the other thing you ask me what people don't know. He really believes in politics more than his ideology about community. So at every rally we did, his big question is what's the music? You had to have music at a rally. Why? Because you have to bring people in, which meant most 90% of our rallies had a band at it. And that sometimes meant like some of the biggest touring acts in the world and sometimes meant the local garage band from the college that was going to do top 40 hits. But he always felt like there had to be some music at every rally because rallies should be community events. I'm like Katy Perry. Well, I mean, rallies are like community events and so are, you know, baseball stadiums are venues, minor league stadiums, especially that get used by the community. We have one where I live in Rockland County, north of of New York. And, you know, I, I don't know that much about the economics of it all, but it gets used. And my daughter just graduated, you know, high school or rather eighth grade, which is stupid, but they had it there because there's so many students in this dumb school and had it at the stadium. The point being the community uses the stadium for so many reasons during COVID. That's where people were going or a power outage. That's where people go. Anyway, it's an interesting uh, point. And so at what point did a Bernie decide to run for president? Because you went to the white house, Obama was still in office and you accompanied him because he no, this, it was, was, this was 2018. We met when I accompanied Obama. Oh, this was uh, the later, the second time. Yes. 
Well, tell me that story anyway, because I just brought it up, because that's fascinating. Okay, so you walked into the, the White House. I'm very jealous that, that Obama just, like, put his arm around you and, and, and brought you in. So it wasn't the White House. It was his office, which is kind of near, kind of between where GW is and, and Georgetown in D.C. It's kind of right on the border. Forgive me, of course. He's no longer president, sadly. It's 2018. Trump's in office. Yeah. and his 2018. Uh, Bernie's thinking about running for president, and so he wants to kind of do the, like, he says, should I meet with Obama? I should meet with Obama and talk about it. I haven't decided yet, but I should talk about it. So he calls. So he asked me to set up a meeting. I, we set up a meeting. We go over to his office, to Obama's office. And my plan was it was just going to be the two of them in do the meeting. That was the plan. We kind of get to the office and there's this like narrow hallway with like a reception desk, not like his, his assistant sits at. And Obama comes out and he greets Bernie and Bernie walks in and I'm kind of walking away and Obama kind of sweeps his arm around me and like kind of thrusts me into the office. Huh. And I was like, uh, okay. So now I'm like pushed into the office and I have no idea why that happened. And so now it's just me, Barack Obama and Bernie Sanders. For in Barack. I'm sorry. For corroboration for a future book. Yes. So we're in, we're in this, in his office, which is like, has all like the trappings of like, you know, there's like a Nobel prize on the wall and stuff. And like, they sit down, they do like, you know, a little gossip, a little small talk. And Obama was finally was like, so you're here because you're going to run for president. Bernie was like, I haven't decided yet. And Obama starts going through like kind of it, his advice. And there's this moment, it, it kind of turns where Obama says like, look, Bernie, you're an Old Testament prophet. You give the Democratic Party moral guidance on where it should be. But prophets don't get to be king. And the point he was making, he kind of went on to make this was, if you're going to be the leader of the Democratic Party, you have to make compromises and do things you are unwilling to make. You can't be the leader of the Democratic Party and not be a Democrat. You can't like you and can't you're gonna do to, you're going to have to lie a little bit, too, which is something that Bernie Senator Sanders has a hard time. Yeah, you're going to have to you're going to have to kiss the ass of the of the Democratic Party chair in blah, blah, blah county. You're going to have to wear a appeal- T-shirt. Right. You're going to have to. Well, we can get to that story. That was uh, you're going to have to do those things. And are you willing to do them? And Bernie was kind of like, no, I don't think I have to do those things. I don't think I have to compromise on that. And it it was interesting because it was the two of them who are two guys with both with big egos. uh, Kind of having this and, and both of whom I do believe actually respect each other. And both of whom have affection for each other. But it was very clear that Obama did not believe Bernie was a good person to lead the party and was very clear that Bernie wasn't going to take his advice. And what you were talking about, the T-shirt happened at the James Clyburn world famous fish fry. Yeah. And when asked why it was world famous, James Clyburn said, because it's my world. (laughs) And indeed. But it's one of those events during the campaign where every candidate kind of has to come and kiss some politician's ass. There's like. The Tom Harkin steak fry was the old one. Now it's the Polk County steak fry. You know, there's all these events like that, that every politician has to go to. So Jim Clyburn fish fry, which is basically boiling hot temperatures in South Carolina. So all it's the first event where every candidate, including Biden, was in a room together. And all the candidates are there and they have one staffer in the room and they hand out these Jim Clyburn fish fry T-shirts. And every candidate's putting them on. And every candidate immediately realizes what they have to do. So I walk up with the T-shirt burning. I said, you got to put this on. He looks at it, he puts it, he sees everyone else, he puts it on. He's standing in line to line up, and he's like, I, yeah, I'm not wearing this. Takes it off hands to me. It's like, Senator, you have to wear the, the T-shirt. I'm not wearing the t It makes me look stupid I'm not wearing the T-shirt. Like, you're going to look stupider if everybody's wearing a T-shirt and you're not wearing a T-shirt. Right. Not wearing We fight about this for five <laughs> minutes. I, like, realize I'm not winning this. Like, this, there's no point. Okay, Clyburn's staff looks like they're going to kill me because they can't kill him, right? right? So they're like, why aren't you doing that? I was like, the hell you want me to do? I tried. So he walks out on stage where every other candidate's wearing the Jim Clyburn fish fry t-shirt, except Bernie. And the media is, of course, like, why isn't Bernie? Like, trying to get, like, some analysis of, like, why. And it's like, because he didn't want to wear the stupid t-shirt. And in the end, his reasoning was not wrong. It, it's... His reasoning was the thing that as a staffer could make working for Bernie the most difficult thing in the world. Yeah. 
but also why I loved working for Bernie because he was fundamentally right. Like you have, you have a group of 20 people, one of whom is likely to be the most powerful person on planet earth. And to get that job, they all have to wear a t-shirt that makes them all look dumb right. because they don't fit. They're not like washed. They they're, you know, they're, it's like a really bad fitting, weird colored blue t-shirt. Why are you making all these candidates wear, wear these t-shirts that don't fit them to show like, like, why do we want to make, and, and his point was like, it doesn't work. It makes me uncomfortable. It makes me dumb. Why can't we go out and talk about important issues, which is what we're doing? Like they all have to give a speech on important issues and just do that. Now, you know, from a staffer perspective, you're like, why, why do I want to get yelled at here? Cause that's, what's going to happen. Right. But also from like a, like from working for Bernie, it's like, yeah, like, you know, like it's stupid and he's right now. Honestly, every other politician on earth makes that compromise except Bernie Sanders. Right. Right. And that's so true of, of so much uh, more about him as a, as a politician from mayor to congressman to Senator as well. And, and you can see it both ways in terms of how it holds him back and how it doesn't. You talk about all kinds of his idiosyncrasies. he He is willing People think he's intransigent and not willing to compromise. It's just not true. Right. So, so like, you know, him and John McCain negotiated one of the largest veterans packages in history, which required some major ideological compromises from Bernie, but he did it because he thought it would, it would move things through when, uh, you know, when Biden's elected and Bernie's chair of the budget committee, he was responsible for passing a $1.7 trillion bill the first reconciliation package that had a lot of things he wanted, but also required a ton of compromise on his right. part with other members. Frankly, on this package that never had the, 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 the reconciliation bill that never was, this isn't in the book. Um, Schumer asked Bernie in May of 2000, it, it, May of 2021 to go get every member of the Senate budget committee, including which includes some moderates, signed off on a $3.5 trillion package. And Bernie went around and met with every single one and compromised and talked and got them all signed off, did what Schumer wanted. He has the ability to compromise when he sees something that benefits his ideology. He's just not going to make those things he views as silly. Well, he has the ability to compromise in a lot of different ways, certainly when it comes to legislation passing. But my question is, you know, as long as you've known him and, and, and two campaigns for president as well, How much this is the big question, I think, that the book tries to answer and that you can answer. How much did Bernie Sanders compromise in the first part of his career, certainly his Senate career? And how much more has he been able to because Ari, he himself and what he represents and what he symbolizes is a huge movement of Democrats, progressives, liberals of what we call the Overton window when it comes to kind of ideology and policy more towards what he had kind of always believed, which certainly makes it easier to compromise when a lot of what you believe, how much did he change the movement and what we think and what we believe when it comes to actual policy laws, ideas? Well, I think there's, there's two different questions and this is, this is the divergent divergence of Bernie where he is really unwilling to compromise. And I, I is his, pol- his political beliefs aren't just policies or beliefs in how politics should be conducted, hmm. how things should be grassroots related, how the T-shirt thing, like how politics should be conducted. He's kind of unwilling to compromise on and has always been unwilling to compromise on since he first won his mayor's race in 1980. Uh, in terms of issue stuff, he sees ways to move the ball forward. And I think the question is not. The question for Bernie, how I would compare him to, I think the most, the the best historical comparison where I see Bernie going and you see the patterns emerging is Barry Goldwater, 1964, where Barry Goldwater loses that election. And and the next Republican elected is Richard Nixon, who is not in Barry Goldwater's mode. Right. Right. Who is much who, you know, oddly, Richard Nixon installs many of the kind of liberal reforms in Washington that Republicans really try to dismantle, like the regulatory state grows tremendously under Nixon. EPA and yeah, yeah. But without Goldwater in 64, you don't get Reagan in 1980. 
And it's not like Barry Goldwater's ideology led to legislation in 64, 65, 66. But there's a very clear through line of Goldwater to Reagan. Right. I think and you see that in how the party transforms around him. And you see, you know, Bernie starts his campaign in 2015 and things that were completely radical and out of touch in the bar- beginning of his campaign become kind of, ma- even if they don't pass, are mainstream in the Democratic Party. What do I mean? $15 an hour minimum wage, there wasn't a single Democrat in the Senate who supported it in 2015. Now, nearly every Democrat in the Senate supports it. Now, is it, did it win? No. But is there a difference between one person supporting it and basically 45 to 46? Yes. Because it, it shows you're going to get there, right? Um, college for all. It was crazy he was thinking about it. And now Joe Biden, a moderate, is probably going to do some form of student debt cancellation. That doesn't happen without Bernie moving the window. Right. Right. You know, we've we have one of the largest the child tax credit, which is not Bernie's legislation, but that type of stuff would not happen in a world the way it was done in the first reconciliation package doesn't happen without Bernie extending the Overton window. out. Right. And I think you see a Democratic Party much more willing to move on those issues. At the same time, you see major problems in the Democratic Party that I think Bernie has tried to confront that frankly, haven't been confronted and are major problems. Such as? Look, I think you have a party that is becoming, in looking at like the New York Times poll from this weekend, that's endemic of this problem, a party that is losing its working class roots in terms of both people of color and white working class, but people of working class, people of color also leaving the Democratic Party. When you say they're leaving, does that mean they're going to the Republican Party? They're becoming more conservative? It just means they're just no longer interested in in supporting this political party? If you look at that New York Times poll, some are going to the Republican Party and the Democratic Party is becoming whiter. Uh, It's not like it's, you know, it's still more people of color in the Democratic Party than the Republican Party. But the, the, the boundaries are shifting. And you see that in that poll and you see this over a long term trend a wealthier party, a more elite party, a more educated party, which that's not a bad thing, but you're losing pieces of the country you need to build a national coalition. Hmm. And I think the problem you see is the problem you see is the Democratic Party is really well set to win a majority of voters in this country because we've done it in almost every presidential election and since 1992, because 92, we win a plurality. 96, we win a plurality. 2000, Democrats win a plurality. They lose in 2004. They win a plurality in 2008. They win a plurality in 2012. They win a plurality in 2016. They win a plurality in 2020. Right. So eight, eight national elections versus one oh four with a wartime president against the very flawed Democratic nominee. Um, you, you know, that's a trend. At the same time, Democrats have lost thousands of state legislative seats. They've lost thousands, like they've lost a lot of governorships. They've lost, you know, we take take a place where Congress, which used to be kind of a lock for Democrats, is now more more Republican because of redistricting and other things, but also because of the shape of the party. And also the Senate has become a lot harder for Democrats, which isn't redistricting. It is the Senate. And that's that's a problem like we have a we have to reform our like look we should live in a system where one person equals one vote unfortunately we don't and i would be for changing that system but also we have to look at what that leads to i miss your analysis on on these things on on the radio so it's great to hear your thoughts and then i'm tempted to to just keep kind of asking you questions about that but i do want to get back to the book which you worked so hard on and spent a lot of your time and, and, and your life on what did you learn from Bernie Sanders? You always struck me as kind of a know-it-all. Um, he's not, he is, no, uh, no, you, you, you did. Oh, that's nice. No, I mean, uh, like you're a smart, I, I, I'm not, I'm not taking a shot at you. I mean, you really are uh, a very, very smart guy. I never, I never had a conversation with you where I was like, Oh, I just taught Ari something. No, uh, look, I, one of the things is what I learned from him, uh, and I think he is brilliant at, 
is actually he's brilliant at taking ideas and cutting them down to their simplest formulation, which I feel like Democrats are really bad at. Like if a Democrat introduces a health care plan, they're like a health care plan for a stronger and healthier America. And Bernie's like Medicare for all. Right. If a college for our future, college for all, like he gets very, very he's very good at cutting things down to their simplest element and just telling people what you want to give them. Right. It's a real lesson from him on how to communicate, because that's what he does. He says, what should government do for you? And I'm going to tell you that. Right. Like, I'm not going to try to, like, message this or be cute. And it's a reminder that, like, there's this kind of obsession I hear among Democrats that it's always like try to come up with the cutest message when often that cutest message doesn't work. I'll give you an example. Like, Democrats always got obsessed with Frank Luntz calling the estate tax the death tax. Yeah. Right. But the truth is, regardless of how many times Republicans said death tax, guess what? People still overwhelmingly support higher estate taxes and higher death taxes. Like overwhelmingly, people like yeah, rich people should pay a lot more money for people that make like ten million dollars or more. Almost everybody agrees with that. Yeah. And you don't even have to say ten million dollars or more. There is a group of people who hate it and there is a group of people who doesn't apply to it. But the messaging of death tax it sounded cute, but it didn't really work all that well. Hmm. And it gave like Republicans like to say, it's not like it changed the, the balance on that issue. You, that issue has always been pop, popular. Now, who is it not popular among donor class who obviously are the people who right. small business owners and certain farmers who have mainly been exempt, but still feel threatened by it. But other than that, it's been a, it, and that's not because you called it death tax. And that's my point. Bernie, kind of ignores all that. Like we never, we did a ton of polling during the campaign. We never pulled a single mess of Bernie message of something that would come out of his mouth. Wow. Which if we did, he would, he would have killed us. Right. He would have been like, that's the dumbest thing. And I'm not listening. He would have done the opposite just because we did that. <laughs> I love that you guys called him Earl in text chats and behind his back, the, you know, so nobody knew who you're talking about. Uh, well, that was we we there was o- there was always a problem of like how do you what do you do if you're out in Burlington or DC and you say Bernie because like you say Bernie and everyone's like oh so and and a bunch of us have like we're not unknown like some of the senior staff we're not unknown people especially to reporters so how do we do it so we started calling him Earl and then our text chat on the campaign among senior staff was called was called Earl uh I love uh, that. Uh, to communicate there's a fun, fun one of the fun little nuggets to to read about in, in in the in the book so let's talk about just the moniker of socialists and socialism and maybe yep. a, a good way to talk about it and you can talk about you know an anecdote from the book is how bernie sanders and alexandria ocasio cortez relationship begins and how a young woman of you know uh what is it puerto rican background and a very and much older man who's of Jewish background, you know, very different lives, same city, I guess, H- how they somehow become friendly and, and respectful of each other. Talk, talk to me about the, the socialist moniker and what it means today. Yeah. So first off, what's interesting is if I were to ask what the, you think the median Bernie supporter is, most people would say like a college white hipster guy, mm-hmm. but that actually wasn't true. The median Bernie supporter was actually a young Latina woman. Wow. Uh, like two groups that supported us nearly a hundred percent, like Latinas under 30. We, you didn't even have to target. You just message them. And by the way, Muslims also huh. like nearly a hundred percent support in the Muslim community for Bernie Sanders. What's that which, for? Um, w- honestly, because I think he was one of the few people not, He's what's interesting is Bernie would consider himself a Zionist. He would consider himself a supporter of Israel, but he also doesn't consider himself kind of Supplicant. he's not he's not. A, and he doesn't he doesn't you know, he he would say, like, I say basic things and people get very excited about it. He was like, I just said Palestinians should have rights. He's like, I don't understand why that's a controversial right, right. statement. He's like, people should have human rights. He kind of felt, you know, the same thing with trans stuff. He's like, yeah, people should be treated equally. I don't understand what's the, I don't understand what the big deal is. Right. People should not be discriminated against and be allowed to live. Anyway, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, we meet. So he has, so she's running against Joe Crawley. 
a, a few people had noted the race to us early the night she win. So a few weeks before that race, Joe Crawley, who and him and Bernie, they knew each other, did not have a good relationship with mm. each other. He like runs up to Bernie at an event outside Capitol Hill and is like, we should do a meeting. And Bernie's like, yeah, sure. Schedule it with my staff, Joe, and walked away. And he, Joe, Bernie was like, well, that guy's nervous about his about his race. And we go. She wins that night. I, and it's New York, which is like one of the weird like. New York is one of the hardest states in terms of gerrymandering, voter suppression, all this. There's a lot of like very strict rules that have been loosened somewhat. But back then they were super strict. So there wasn't a lot of hope. She wins. They get on the phone. They decide to go to Kansas together. So Bernie, me, AOC and AOC staffer, this guy Corbin, end up driving across Kansas together. And what's very clear is Bernie is looking at her as as somebody who understands communications on a level that he doesn't Hmm. like he sees her Twitter account. He sees other things. He's like, wow, she's like really smart at that. And she's, and she's asking him about how to operate in Congress, how to think about things. And it's a very, it's a very two way relationship. It's not like mentor mentee. They're kind of coming together Uh, during the campaign. Like, I, I don't think people give her enough credit, even Bernie supporters for, the risk she took when she endorsed Bernie. Let's talk about the state of the campaign. The polling in Iowa pre heart attack had us in fourth place. Elizabeth Warren was just peeking over Joe Biden. Yeah, Bernie, Bernie Sanders had third. a heart attack in October. You write a, a whole thing about that, but, but this is Bernie now. Had a heart attack. Yeah. And four days later, AOC calls the hospital and says, or three days later, AOC calls the hospital and says, I'm endorsing. And she's in office at that point. She's an office. It, She's a member. Yeah. So it's her, the squad, her, and it was her, Rashida and Ilhan all are endorsing. And it really, it was a galvanizing moment that really turned the campaign around that kind of was part of turning the campaign around, I should say. And, but the, their relationship, the thing about Bernie is he really, when I say it's two ways, he really, he really believes people like her and it, to some extent, even like Cardi B, when they met, he was like, wow, like she understands something about how to reach people and talk to people right. that I don't. Right. I can learn. She might not understand. He said like Cardi B, she doesn't understand the policy, but she understands how to communicate it to people better than any politician. Yeah. And he really respects that fundamentally. I mean, probably more than anything else through certain platforms like TikTok or Twitter or Instagram or something. Right. No. I'm, I'm guessing. I mean, did, did did Senator Sanders ever really understand or does he or does anybody that age understand, you know, how to use social media effectively to communicate their political theories and ideas? He understands a few things like he is a Facebook user. He does have an account that he uses to kind of scroll Facebook mm-hmm. uh, more than Twitter. I think he likes Facebook more than Twitter in terms of as a user experience because he doesn't like the character limit on Twitter, I think, as a. <laughs> From a user experience, he understood fundamentally and he caught on really early kind of the power of video on Facebook, especially and YouTube. He really when Facebook started to really push Facebook live, he really glommed onto that and understood the power of doing live events and using that kind of format to push things. And then he also look, he was very trusting and open to a group of staff um, Especially early on, this woman, Georgia Park, who is br- brilliant, who ran his social media accounts for a long time. And then this guy, Armand, who was his video editor, who's still his video editor to this day, who kind of made these short form, two minute edited videos. And Bernie, Bernie really glommed on and also really was involved, meaning he really holds his world sacrosanct. So he trusted them, but he also would talk like would engage them and under, want to understand how to how to communicate and how best to do it. And in fact, with Facebook, it led to a tr- uh, a, one of the strangest conversations. So at some point in 2017, 2018, we realized our Facebook numbers froze and, were, and it was going against all the other social media platforms. And we had a meeting with Facebook and we had a series of meetings with Facebook and it turned out they had adjusted their algorithm and it capped us. It capped our growth basically. Uh, 
it can't, they first they denied it, then we showed them the charts, and then they're like, oh, we flipped the button and it did this. And, um, but the me, but it was about how much reach posts are getting, and Bernie wanted to understand the algorithm. And like senior people at Facebook came in, like uh, uh, Adam Mosari, who's now the head of Instagram, mm. who then was the head of Newsfeed at Facebook, literally came to the office to kind of brief to talk to Bernie about how Newsfeed works. And he had a conversation with Sheryl Sandberg. But there was this post election meeting that got really contentious for a number of reasons. But the most contentious moment was. We had done this event and there and Bernie was asking why it didn't pick up on the platform. And because he just wanted to understand how the platform was working. And this young Facebook staffer was like, well, if you focused on this issue and not this issue and you had this person do this and did this person do this. And it was very it wasn't about methodology. It was about how you talked about issues and how you did that. And Bernie was like. So you're telling me you want to tell me, and this was on the government side. This wasn't on the campaign side. Bernie was saying, you want to tell me how I should talk to my constituents? And this Facebook person was like, yes. And he got up and walked out of the meeting. And the Facebook person turned and was like, your boss is a miserable old coot. <laughs> and, and I turned and threw them out of the office. And they were like, the more senior lobbies, really, because you don't do that in the Senate office. They came back in. And the woman, as a form of apology, goes, goes, well, I used to work for Chuck Schumer, and I think he's a miserable old coot, too. Oh, wow. Which, which it was just such an egotistical moment on the part of Facebook, because it was really like, we should tell you what to say if you want to maximize yourself. On yeah, the yeah. I mean, that's that. But by the way, isn't that what social media or isn't that what ratings does to radio and television? Isn't that what, you know, I guess we were pretty free of that at Sirius XM for, for the most part, which is nice. But in most media... You, you got to kind of say what's going to aggregate the biggest possible audience. But and that has the, nothing to the do. One, with- the one difference is if you're on TV, the TV channel doesn't, the TV set doesn't put your channel to other channels. Like right. right great. Point. Doesn't choose your channel. Great. Point. Where Facebook yeah. chooses the channels you're watching. Right. And that's, that's the problem. If you know, this is, this is, and, that's where you get into the weird thing, especially on the government side, where you'd find that, you know, there's you're talking about a elected leader communicating with their constituents on the government side. If you want to be in the middle of that process, Bernie's point is you can't jam yourself in the middle and then suggest you get to say what they have to say. Even if it's automatic, it, it puts too much power on Facebook. The other thing about Bernie Sanders, I guess, is, let's just move on from social media. Just another another thing about him and, and why it matters. I wanted to get your take is he's always been very on message and repetitive. And it's almost like, you know what he's going to say by having the TV on on mute. He's been saying pretty much very similar things for as long as I've been familiar with with his profile as a public person about taxing the wealthy, about climate. Yesterday, he was amazing on ABC's This Week, just savaging Joe Manchin, I thought, in such an effective and important way. Uh, does that help him or 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 hurt him that he has been saying some of the same things in interviews on the stump for his entire career? Both. So it hurts in that the news covers what's new. Right. Right. And what he says isn't often new, so it's sometimes harder to get coverage. But at the same time, it means you can always be confident about what he says. One story that's not in the book was the Sasha Barrett Cohn, Bernie Sanders Mm running, which you could see it was on Showtime. He was doing that show where he was interviewing politicians and a lot of politicians got really embarrassed because he like they said a lot like people said a lot of stupid things. Yeah, they ended up catching Bernie. They ended up getting an interview with Bernie. It was actually a major fight between us and Showtime, CBS and Showtime. What happened? Because we basically got lied to by Showtime to schedule the interview. We had a good relationship with them because of the because of the circus and some other shows. And they claimed they wanted to do an interview for one show, and it turned out to be Sasha Baron Cohen. Mm-hmm. But here's the, and then they kind of like kidnapped Bernie in the middle of the interview and stuck him in a room with Sasha Baron Cohen. And I think what they were trying to do is not have young staffers who would have probably recognize what was going on. Bernie gets back and he goes, he, we didn't know it was Sasha Barrett Cohen at the time. He goes, that was the strangest interview I've ever done. It was a guy in the wheelchair talking about very weird stuff. And he described the interview 
what he said. And we're like, because we were trying to figure, we'd be like, is it James O'Keefe doing something? Like, what's going on? Yeah, right. And we ultimately figured out what it was a few months later. And we watched it. And here's what's amazing. He's in front of Sasha Baron Cohen, who's in a we- pretending he's like, Sasha Baron Cohen's pretending he's a redneck in a powered wheelchair from West Virginia interviewing Bernie. And by the way, the irony of this is, had Showtime said, we want to do a show where a conservative interviews Bernie about conservative issues, Bernie probably would have done it, which is the funny part, because he liked doing things like that. Um, but that, that was kind of the setup. But Sasha Baron Cohen was doing his thing. And what you see is Bernie, like, he doesn't break, right? He's like, okay, the income and wealth inequality. Like, he doesn't. You cannot break him even in those. So everyone else is like politicians are trying to like kiss the Sasha Baron Cohen character's ass. This is the show where Rudy Jew, where uh, Matt Gates said something dumb about guns. You know, there's the Rudy Giuliani taking his pants off. That was a different thing, but kind of the same concept with Sasha Baron Cohen. Bernie does not break, stays completely, even in that situation, stays 100 percent Bernie, including him at one point, stopping the interview and talking to the producer without staff in there and being like, what's, go- what's going on? Here, right. This is, this is very good. Like, there's no break in character. There's no... I might go back and, him- and watch that and include that at the end of this interview. Which, I remember. by the way, could be... The, the thing about Bernie that's frustrating for interviewers is you're never going to get him to break message. He is actually... And this is the thing. He is one of the most disciplined politicians I've yeah. ever worked with in that way. Yeah. I used to interview him. I interviewed him several times this year. I always tried to get him to lighten up, but I really, you know, with some kind of lighthearted question, what does Bernie Sanders eat for breakfast or something? But he would just, you know, he just moved past it. He didn't give a shit. I eat the tears of the rich. What is it? I eat the tears of the rich on my cornflakes. <laughs> I drink Bernie the is, tears Bernie, of rich Bernie people. Eats, Bernie's an oatmeal guy for breakfast. Sometimes oh, eggs. He also likes the hearty, like, eggs, bacon, pre-heart attack. Pre-heart attack, right. Pre-heart attack, yeah, you wrote he, he ate uh, Milano cookies, and after, he ate uh, oranges or something like that. See, yes, and Outback Steak was our primary source of sustenance before. I love that. I, that sound, when, well, it, when you wrote that, steak, like, yeah. when, you, you, when you wrote that, you went to, like, lower, medium-tier, you know, uh, steak restaurants. It made me think of what I love to do on the road and made me a little jealous. Um, before I let you go, I'm yeah. loving this book, and I'm loving talking to you, and I hope that we can talk more often, Ari, uh, about, the, about the world. Um, w- tell me something else. Tell me something else from the book, an anecdote that uh, that you think is is interesting, entertaining, symbolic of who he was or your relationship with him. Um, look, I think the book begins, and I, look, I just think it's, the, the heart attack itself was such a pivotal, not to end on a downer, but I, I, do think I begin the book there, but the other moment that was amazing and it just speaks to our politics. And I go through it in the book is the moment he bumped his head in South Carolina. And I was going to begin the book there actually in the beginning. And, uh, but what it said, it, this is a moment that really shows his resilience. We were in the third week of the campaign. I get a knock on my door at six in the morning and it's Bernie's body, man. This, this kid Terrell knocks on my door and he says, and it trails like the, he's like this calm. He's the most calm person you've ever met. He's like, Ari, you need to come to Bernie's room. It's an emergency. Hmm. It's like six in the morning. Right. And like Terrell was like, Oh shit. If he's talking like that, I got to run to his room. Like I go to Bernie's room. He's sitting up on his bed. He's in like an undershirt boxers. And he's just got like a bandage on his head. Like this. he's holding his head like this, with like a towel. And I'm like, take it off. And his head is like gashed open. And I was like, can you get up? We went through it. We figured out how to get him to the hospital, to this clinic, to get him stitches. Um, what happened, you know, he bumped his head against the glass door of the shower with the lights off in the bathroom. Um, there was blood everywhere in that bathroom. Uh, Terrell and I ended up, I ended up stealing towels and like ammonia off the maze cart. And because the room looked like Dexter, and we just like, and Charla, who was the other staffer, ended up hiding the towels in a place I don't know where they were. She burned them somewhere. She won't tell me where to so stay. Won't, so they won't be sold on eBay of Ber- Bernie Sanders' blood. But, yeah, just weird, like pictures, other things. But we get to the thing. They they stitch him up. They say nothing else is wrong with him. 
they, you know, they give him like the preventative antibiotics when you have the, your head bashed open. Um, and I'm like, okay, I've canceled events for the rest of the day. Well, we were supposed to fly to Las Vegas. I was like, we'll just fly to Las Vegas. I've canceled events. He's like, why? Like you, your head's bashed open. Yeah. Why are we canceling events? We put them back on the calendar. Okay. And he just goes about his day, flies to Las Vegas, like does three events in South Carolina, flies to Las Vegas, does an event in Las Vegas. Like you can't, he's got some like amazing constituency that I could, the reason I ended up leaving him actually a year ago now is I was like, I can't keep up with him. Wow. I, I really can't. My, my other funny story, I'll end with this. I'll end on a more lighthearted one. We're in Iowa campaigning for J.D. Schlott, who was running for Congress. And J.D. wants to film a game of ho- playing horse on a basketball court with Bernie and Deborah DeGere, who was running for Secretary yeah, of State. I had her on. And the three of them are playing horse. Mm-hmm. And J.D. is a prof- former professional athlete. He played minor league baseball. He's also half Bernie's age, more than half Bernie's age. Right. And J.D. wins the game of horse. And Bernie's not happy. He literally get in the car. He is frustrated with himself for not being able to beat an, a professional athlete half his age at basketball. Like he's 80 and he's hitting shots from the three point line. And he's literally, he's a very good basket. He's like a very good basketball player, actually. Like that's the other yeah. thing. If you want to know what people don't know about Bernie, the guy's actually an athlete. Yeah. Like, he's athletic. He's, you can, you can tell he's very, very athletic similar. and was yep. one of the top distance runners in New York city as a high school kid. And you could just, that's always like a very athletic guy, which is something people just don't expect. Well, listen, Ari, I love talking to you and I could keep talking to you. I'm really enjoying the book, The Fighting Soul on the Road with with Bernie Sanders. I hope everybody goes and, and gets it. What's up next for you? When can I talk to you again about all the... You can talk to me anytime. I've been doing a lot of stuff. Uh, I've been doing two things. I decided to take it a little easier. I've been doing some international work in in Europe, mainly. And then, uh, like my other advising type stuff. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I have been, uh, the other thing I do is photograph sharks. I'm sorry. Photograph sharks. What are you talking about? Like sharks that swim in the ocean. You go underwater with them. Yeah. You scuba dive and you're, you're an underwater photographer. Yeah. I've been doing that a little bit. I need to pursue some passion and I really do love that. I mean like that. I don't see that. I don't see that at all. I'm very interested in that and fascinated by it. Do you share those photos anywhere? I just read an article today that there's been like a lot more shark attacks this year. Well, there's been sharks coming closer. Yeah, you can. Well, there's my Instagram handle, which is at Ari Rabenhoft, but I also have the Instagram handle at sharks. No way. Yeah. You know that tiger sharks are anti-Semites, right? I'd stay away from Long Island. Well, you can come. I just actually put a picture before I went on air of me of a tiger shark. And there's a there's a nice little reel of tiger shark of me really? and tiger shark. Yeah. Am I right about their feelings? Are they really anti Semitic or Well, they didn't bite me, but you know, some people would say I work for Bernie, so therefore I don't count, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you so much, Ari. It was awesome. Congrats. Ladies and gentlemen, Ari Rabenhoff. And I hope that you like that conversation and I hope that you Go check out the book. I hope that you tweet Ari and let him know that uh, you appreciate him joining me here on the show as well. All of those things would be great. The Fighting Soul on the Road with Bernie Sanders. And now finally, I'm very excited to welcome Pete Coe into the show. He, of course, does the intros and jingles and all kinds of contributions to the show and to our community. He's become a good friend of mine. And he pitched the idea of while he was traveling on his vacation in Scandinavia with his family and, and some friends, maybe he could do some dispatches and and, and send them in. And so I said, yes, indeed, because Pete is always great, funny, interesting, curious, passionate, thoughtful, and always sounds great on on the show. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the first installment. And anybody else who wants to do similar things, Pete is opening the door for you. It's time for Annoying American Abroad with Pete Coe. Annoying American Abroad. Well, hey there. Welcome to our new segment here on Stand Up, where Americans abroad ask questions of locals and most likely annoy them. 
Our goal is to talk to interesting people from other countries and give our mostly American stand-up community of listeners a more international perspective. Today, we're in the capital of Sweden, Stockholm, where, according to the great Swedish scholar Rick Steves, one in five Swedes call home. Hopefully, we can gain insight into how Swedish culture is expressed through various art, music, architecture, and their own unique place in the world as purveyors of tourist Viking helmets. Strangely enough, no Swedish people cared to talk to me today, so we're going with pretty much the same thing. Let's bring in a French person, my friend Benoit. How's it going today? I'm good, thanks. Okay, well, you're from France originally. Mm -hmm. Did you have to scale a wall to live in Sweden? To scale a wall? What does that mean? Did you have to climb a wall? Did you have to? Was there a wall blocking your path <clears throat> to freedom? No. No. No, I got lucky on that one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I would say you did. Yeah, well, later we might need to see some documentation on that. Um, but America is now famous for our open borders. Uh -huh. the, yeah, the, thanks to Obama. The western and the eastern ones. Yes. And um, were there any rules at all to moving your family here? Uh, no, none, because we're French. And uh, France and Sweden are both part of the European Union, so we can move anywhere we want, any country. In the Union. How many languages do you speak currently? Two and a half. Two and a half. And the half is the Swedish part, yes. as I understand it. Yes. Yeah. You're still sort of learning the local language, the language of the locals? Uh, yeah, a bit every day. Now that I understand a bit what they're saying, it's easier to catch up. But yeah, between COVID and uh, yeah, working mostly in English and people speaking back mostly in English. People speaking back mostly in English. I, I know Sweden is a land of lots of free stuff. Mm -hmm. So free healthcare, education, retirement, definitely part of the allure. Yep. Uh, you have three kids. Yep. All school age now. Mm -hmm. Are you satisfied with the quality of education they're getting so far? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They went to uh, the Swedish school um, for a while. And now they're into the French one. So they, uh, they learn a bit about their family. Uh, but it's been yeah, it's been great. Yep yeah, the 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 French school. There's a French school here. Yeah, yeah, a French international school. There's one in every uh, capital city or something. Yeah. What about what about CRT? How are they with that? What's CRT? Uh, <laughs> I'm actually not sure what it is. It's okay. just yeah, it, or, it's uh, just something you're not supposed to learn apparently. Yeah. Okay. What about the gay agenda? Do they learn about that? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, you went to a few museums today. Uh -huh. Which are those? So we went to actually just one, the Vasa Museum. The it, it's about a big boat that a king uh, got built early uh, 16, 20. And it, the first time it sailed, it sunk, like, after five minutes. But it was the biggest boat back in the days for five minutes, well decorated, and uh, it sunk in the uh, just in in the middle of the city, where it got built. And uh, 50 years ago or something, they found it back and uh, take it out of the water, and started restoring it. And it's uh, yeah, it's in the museum now in uh, in Stockholm. So why do you think that Sweden? celebrates their most spectacular failure in uh -huh. history with a museum. Is it just the way that the boat looks? It's a beautiful uh, boat. Yes. It was very special back in the days and it, it yeah, it's yeah. been special. It's historically, history. it's historically <laughs> important. Okay. And, uh, even, yeah, <clears throat> even though it, it didn't work apparently. Yeah. I think yeah. also the, uh, the fact that they, uh, it was well preserved and they, they could take it out. Uh, it was a technological achievement as well in 50 years ago. Lots of things that happened in Sweden are tied to one king, Gustav Vasa. And if I recall, that was his boat. But there was another museum that you went to, right? Or did you only go to the Vasa Museum? No, we only went to the Vasa Oh, you only yeah. did. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you didn't go to the... Uh, there's there's other museums around, though. There's the... Oh, there's, there's tons. The, yeah. there's, a, there's an island full of museums uh, in the city. And we, when we, uh, yeah, when we went out of the subway to go to uh, to that place, we uh, we we passed by the uh, history museum. Mm -hmm. And the history museum is where they 
they they really push the, uh, the Vi- I saw the sign. The Viking agenda? The Viking, yeah. the Viking agenda, uh-huh. correct. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. I was going to say Viking angle, but Viking agenda sounds much more interesting. Yeah, so maybe later on we could talk about the Viking agenda, but we're going to go to dinner later. Mm-hmm. And what are you going to be feeding us? Uh, crêpe. We're going to crêperie. So it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's kind of very French, uh, but they, they like it here. They have a few uh, in the city and uh, on ski slopes in the north. So we thought it would be a good place to go. Okay. Well, we'll not, have... not necessarily very Swedish, though. Not necessarily very Swedish. Well, that's okay, because like I said, you know, it's basically the same thing. So we'll have to go and come back and continue the conversation, maybe see what everyone thought about the scrapes, right? Sure. Crepes? Crepe, yeah. Crepe. 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 Yeah, crepe. Crepe. <laughs> crepe. Well, that was a lovely dinner. I had the... I don't even remember the name of what I had, but why don't you tell us what you had, Benoit? I had a luxe uh, complet. Luxe complet. So that means that... What did that consist of? Uh, complet is when it's typically when you have egg, ham and cheese in a French Brittany uh, crepe. And the luxe part here was to add creme fraiche, tabasco and bacon. But then your son had to switch with somebody, didn't he? Yeah. Because he didn't like the Tabasco. No, no, no. So there was a Tabasco fiasco, if you don't mind me saying. Uh Uh-huh. I don't. Yeah. So that's good. Mine was very good, too. I had the same thing, but without the um, some of the greens and stuff like that. Uh Uh-huh. I should have probably had greens because I need my roughage while I'm traveling. That's very important. You and I are old friends, so I feel like I've just stopped by and said hello before being on my way. But I wanted to ask a serious question. Mm -hmm. We're closer to a war zone, as you're aware. Yeah, Ukraine. Yes. And you guys at one point had a refugee family staying with you for, how long was it? A couple Uh, of months? Yeah, less than a couple of months. Yeah. What was that like? So we had four uh, women. Uh, one in each generation, 13, 42, 74, 94. Um, from the, yeah, mother of the mother of the mother of the daughter. <laughs> so four generations, wow. Yeah. Uh, living in our place uh, until they found some, yeah, uh, a charity building where they, they got their own room, bathroom, and some, yeah, commons to, uh, to eat and do the laundry and stuff in the city. Right. So that was quite intense um, yeah. in a good way. Because mm-hmm. uh, you're always making room for the others, leaving space uh, to them, and uh, yeah, making sure that they are feeling good here, as good as yeah. they can, considering the context. So uh, where are they now? Where where do you know? Did you uh, know yeah, yeah, they're in the city. There's uh, they found uh, one of the yeah charities here has buildings in the city uh, to host people that yeah don't have a roof, uh, refugees or homeless people. Mm-hmm. And they give them they give them a room with their own bathroom as well uh, and some commons as I was saying uh, until they find a proper uh, place for their own. Like you say, it's a very intense experience. So that was very kind of you and your family to do that. And well, that's the right thing to do. Yeah, but I think there is one more thing we need to talk about because there was um, a little bit of an incident uh-huh. with the uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, the, res- the wrestling incident? The wrestling incident, yes. So apparently you reached back to your days in America and some of that American culture came flooding to you <laughs> and you thought, I'm going to watch... A family movie. A family movie about... A wrestling with your family movie. A wrestling with your family movie. Yeah. Nice. Okay, yeah. And, and what happened? So the So one <laughs> of the refugee family came in and Mm -hmm. spied everybody watching this and laughing and carrying on and came back later and she was was basically uh she came in at the end of the movie uh Mm -hmm. if you've seen it or not basically uh the lead the lead character uh she becomes a yeah a female wrestler in the u.s she she joins from the uk i think the the big leagues in the in north america so she has a major fight, and so they're uh, yeah taking their hair, smashing their heads, jumping from the third rope and stuff, and that's when she came in, and she was appalled that we were 
a watching women fighting because I don't think she knew wrestling. <laughs> and that <laughs> even worse uh, that you were watching it with our kids. Yes. And that was such a bad example. Yes. Yes. Well, so I, she, I think, yes, yeah, she, she noticed it was wrestling uh, or she didn't know and that it was a movie, a family movie. So that cracked us up pretty bad. Well, I hope the, uh, the level of shame you experienced was extremely high. And, uh, you know, it, I, I have to say it could have been worse. You, you know, you could have been watching Sharknado or Sharktopus. Sharktopus. Right. We didn't even get into that, but we'll get into that another time. Okay. I think Sharktopus might be very popular in Finland. What do you think? Uh, let's check. We'll have to see. <laughs> the Viking agenda, it turns out, is to lure tourists into a cave-like establishment where aggressively jovial Swedish men dressed in burlap serve smoked herring, reindeer, honey-flavored beer, and mead. And I have to admit, I was hooked. But unfortunately, we are now sailing away, literally, from Stockholm. The wind off the Baltic Sea is now picking up, and you might hear the occasional squawk of a stowaway gull that is currently eyeing me with evil intent. Stockholm, in all seriousness, is an amazing city. Ease of getting around, beautiful architecture, abundance of urban forest, and a community-oriented culture where their Viking heritage is more of an allure for outsiders than an actual yearning for the past. In fact, the Viking Age was filled with rampant deadly disease, barbaric acts of mass murder, and women dying in childbirth due to the lack of proper reproductive care. Wow, I can only imagine what that's like. Annoying American abroad. Oh, yeah. Oh, I loved it. Thank you, Pete. That was fascinating and uh, something completely different. And I hope people liked it. If you do, maybe we'll get some more on there. Let me know your feedback for Pete and I. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. And Pete, of course, on Twitter at Pete Co. C O E V O. At Pete Co. V O. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you, Mark Leibovitz, Shari Rabenhoff, and of course, Pete Co. in Scandinavia and his friend Benoit. That was really, really good. And thank you. If you are still listening to the show and not supporting it with a paid subscription, please consider doing that now. We've got more and more listeners all the time, but we need those subscriptions to keep coming in or we can't create the podcast each and every day. So please sign up now. Standupwithpete.com and patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Either one. All right. I hope you have a great day. I hope you're doing okay. I hope you're finding joy and a way to cope with the struggle, the suffering that life can so often be. And if you do, let me know how you figured it out. I love you guys. You're the best. John Carroll, take us out. For your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, but they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go all was the time they were in. With other causes for laws and since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look 
Yeah. 